Good morning, and welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church in Morristown on this Pentecost Sunday. We are so glad that indeed we are one in the Spirit, even across the miles. Please join with me in our responsive call to worship. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with fire. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our eyes with visions. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our minds with dreams. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us with hope. Come, Holy Spirit, as we worship God together. Knowing that we worship a God who loves us and knows our name, let us go before God and one another by confessing our sins. After our prayer of confession, we will also have a time of silent prayer followed by our assurance of pardon. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, we do not know how to pray as we ought, and we know too well our constant failures to do as you have commanded and to hold fast to your word. Forgive us for the divisions we nurture. Forgive us when we turn a deaf ear to our neighbors, particularly when we disagree. Forgive us when we close ourselves off from the new things you are trying to do among us. Holy Spirit, intercede for us. Guide us in your way, keep us in your care, and lead us into faith. Amen. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hear the good news of the gospel. In, In Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Good morning. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is the Greek name for the Jewish festival of weeks. This special celebration was held 50 days after Passover. On the day of Pentecost, Jews would travel to Jerusalem to mark the end of the grain harvest. 
During the Pentecost mentioned in our Bible story today, Jesus' followers were filled with the Holy Spirit. Today, as Christians, we think of Pentecost as the birthday of the church. The Holy Spirit is the helper that Jesus sent after he left his disciples and went back to God. The Holy Spirit lives within each of us to help us live as God wants us to live. Even though we can't see or touch the Holy Spirit, we can see the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the people who follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit inspires us to do good works, gives us the power to stand up for Jesus, and helps us to choose what is right and fills us with God's love. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the gifts of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Help us to follow you, be kind to each other, and spread your love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in our unison prayer for illumination. Holy Spirit, come again. Just as long ago you inspired and astonished the people, come to us now to fill our ears with the sound of your breath, to fill our eyes with the brilliance of your presence, and to fill our hearts with your good word. Amen. Today's reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 22 to 27. We know that a whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only in the creation, but we ourselves, who have first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches heart, who knows what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading today is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. A few weeks ago, Eric, Nathan, and I vacationed in Cape May. And on our last day, a huge windstorm kicked up 
with sustained winds of 30 to 35 miles an hour and frequent gusts up to 65 miles an hour. It affected the whole region, so you may remember it. The condo we rented sat right on the edge of the bird sanctuary marshlands, which gave us tremendous views, but also meant that the only thing available to block the wind as far as the eye could see was the back wall of our house. I felt unsettled and anxious that entire day. The constant groaning and pressure of the wind against the windows and the rattles and trembles with every big gust really got under my skin. At moments, the sheer power of the wind awed and exhilarated me. But mostly, I had visions of deck furniture and tiny bird bodies crashing through the sliding doors downstairs. Wind does so much more than potentially destroy, of course. That same blustery day, I looked out those sliding doors over the marshlands and watched the birds cavorting through the same gusts I irrationally feared would hurdle them at the house. They used that wind to help them dive for food, to coast without a single twitch of wing, and maybe even to have a little daredevil birdie fun. As a child, I remember the day I learned just how essential wind is to flying a kite and that I couldn't create that wind for myself. I had built a kite at Girl Scouts, I think, and was so excited to fly it that I took it right out to the field behind my school and ran with all of my might, dragging that kite behind me. I looked back again and again, hoping to see my kite taking flight, but it never happened. There simply wasn't enough wind that day, and I would never run fast enough to lift that kite. We know wind carries great creative power as well. It literally helps shape the face of the earth through erosion. It keeps things moving, weather systems, air pollution, boats, wind surfers, and when harnessed, it can even power a city. When the violent wind and fire of the Holy Spirit blew through the upper room where the disciples were gathered on Pentecost, it must have unsettled them with a mixture of awe, exhilaration, and terror. I wonder if they too feared for their windows and doors both literally and metaphorically. You see, the disciples had spent the time since Jesus's ascension, putting their house in order. While they huddled together and waited, they constantly devoted themselves to prayer, the act of the faithful in times of transition. And as we heard last week, they enacted a strategic process to restore the band of apostles to the perfect 12, the number which matched the 12 tribes of Israel. Everything was neat and tidy and safe, but they weren't going anywhere. Then the tongues of fire descended and the wind blew open their house, blew open their minds, and blew open their mouths. In one divine gust, the Holy Spirit created a proclamation powerhouse. Out of this motley crew of Jesus followers who had a rather long and dubious track record of bumbling cluelessness. Suddenly, the disciples are able to announce God's deeds of power in the native languages of all the diverse peoples of the world who were gathered in Jerusalem. Suddenly, Peter finds himself transformed from a cowardly denier into a bold 
creature. At the Tower of Babel in Genesis, God scattered the peoples of the world by jumbling and confusing their communication. Now at Pentecost, the Spirit empowers the disciples to become conduits across language for the reunification of humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit blows the disciples beyond the safety and comfort of their four walls, their closed group, and their shared language into a large crowd of strangers, some of whom are inclined to believe the disciples are drunk. The Spirit upends the quiet order of the upper room in favor of a wild, abundant explosion of new life for the infant church. The disciples' numbers swell from 120 to over 3,000 in a single day. The wind blows and nothing stays the same. I think we continue to find the Holy Spirit quite unsettling today. We know we can neither predict nor control where its wind will blow and with what force. And that makes us profoundly uncomfortable, especially as type A Northeasterners. As Presbyterians, we also tend to talk about the Holy Spirit a whole lot less than we do about God and Jesus. We give her this one Sunday a year, plus the occasional honorable mention, and that's about it. Through our language and our practices, we show we're more comfortable with the belief that the future of our church, its success or its failure, rests squarely with us. I've heard many pastors in recent years talk about how in this day and age, we can never take our eye off the ball. We can never stop moving, never stop pushing if we hope to survive and to thrive. Now, I know they mean that static complacency will not spread the gospel, nurture disciples, or ensure the ministry and presence of the church into the future. We got away with it when church membership was more of a social norm, but no longer. Our energy, imagination, intelligence, and love are required. But I fear that it's far too easy for us to hear within such statements that this ship will only move forward if we're madly rowing it. Our kite will fly if we only run fast enough. And that's a tremendous amount of pressure, profoundly exhausting and spiritually draining. Plus, when we allow ourselves to act like it's all up to us, we can also persist in the comfortable but misguided belief that we get to chart our own course and control what the church looks like and what the church does. Our temptation toward excessive self-reliance only intensifies when life gets tumultuous and uncertain. And tumultuous and uncertain it is. We continue to live in a deeply divided country and a world shaken by bombs and guns and unrest. We're emerging from the worst of the pandemic in this country and facing our collective trauma as life reopens at a suddenly whiplash pace. We're worried about how many of our people will come back and how many won't and what that will mean for our future. We're continuing to transition through this interim period from the Dave Smazik era into whatever lies ahead. At times like these, we're tempted to 
batten down the hatches, to revert to old habits, and to tighten our grip on any shred of control we can possibly find. But the story of Pentecost encourages us instead to drop our oars, let go of the rudder, and relinquish our control, scary as that may be. It reminds us that the Holy Spirit, wild, untamed, and powerful, is what moves the church forward, and it can move us to heights we've never imagined. The Holy Spirit, recklessly poured out upon all flesh, young and old, male and female, slave and free, is the one God sends to shape us into the beautiful, messy, diverse, unified body of Christ. The Holy Spirit, unpredictable and uncontrollable, is our most trustworthy and reliable guide. Before those tongues of fire and that violent wind, the disciples were all dressed up with nowhere to go. After, they took flight. After, they set the world on fire. May it be so for us. Amen. The Holy Spirit came to increase our compassion and to make us glad to spread good news by caring for those in need. We enter into the discipline of giving as a work of the Holy Spirit within us. May we offer what we have with joyful and generous hearts. Let us now open our hearts and minds in prayer to God. We sing praises to you, O Lord, our Creator. We will sing to you as long as we live, for you have done marvelous things. May our meditations and our prayers be pleasing to you, for we rejoice in you always. In your wisdom, you have created all that we see. The earth is full of your creatures. We give you thanks for the sea, great and wide, for mountain majesties and fruited plains, and for innumerable creeping things, living things both small and great. Inspire us to care for your creation as you do, to cherish its bounty and its beauty, and to work for the renewal of the face of the ground. On this day of Pentecost, we pray for your church as it is born and reborn, Pour out the Holy Spirit and send us out together, aflame with new life. By your Spirit, set us free from the prisons of pettiness, jealousy, greed, and fear. Set us free to be your church, freed to free others, forgiven to forgive others, loved to love others. Send us to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, and to be alleluias even when there is no music. Fill us with your spirit and make us again into your body for the world. Ruler of all, you set the earth on its foundations and put all things in motion. We pray that you would guide the nations of our world in ways of justice and truth and establish among them that peace which is the fruit of righteousness. Particularly, we lift up the ongoing conflict in the Holy Land that continues to claim lives and further entrench long-standing resentments, hatred, and power struggle. How long, O oh Lord, must such violence prevail? Keep us from hardened hearts and help us to live for that day when war will be no more and enemies will sit down as friends. And finally, sustain those among us who need your loving touch, particularly John and Joan, Kirsten, Jean, 
and all those we name before you now. Make the sick whole, sustain the caregivers, give hope to the dying, comfort those who mourn, uphold all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, that they may know the peace and joy of your supporting care. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. May the Holy Spirit blow through your hearts this day, fill you with God's blessing, and set you on fire for the sake of the world. Amen. <laughs>